Uh, so hello everyone to Making Space Accessible for All event of Mars Society, Georgia. Uh, my name is Nika Chinchaladze and I am the founder and president of Mars Society, Georgia. Uh, and we have a very special guest here today, uh, uh, two guests actually, and let me introduce them starting from Emmeline. Uh, so Emmeline Pat Dostrom is a co-founder and CEO of SpaceBase, a social enterprise focused on democratizing space for everyone by co-creating space ecosystems in developing and emerging countries. Uh, she is also a co-author of the book Re Realizing Tomorrow, The Path to Private Spaceflight. Uh, hello, Emmeline. Glad to have you here. And another guest that we have is uh, Eric Dostrom. Uh, he is a space engineer, astronomer, and consultant who has worked on spacecraft design and space science for over 35 years. He worked on the design of the International Space Station for eight years at NASA Langley, where he analyzed design issues involving all engineering systems, configuration options, as well as performing preliminary design of the interface with Russian systems. So very uh, flattered to have you both here. Uh, and uh, looking forward to dive into the discussion about the topic. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Yeah, again, thank you so much for, for giving us the opportunity uh, to talk to the Mars Society in Georgia. Um, so uh, greetings, we're, <laughs> we're, uh, we're actually in the evening time right now because we're in New Zealand. So good morning to everybody. Um, and thank you for the, the wonderful uh, introduction as well. So we'll, we'll just, uh, just, I guess, supplement a little bit um, uh, the introduction about ourselves. Of course. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm uh, originally from the Philippines and I kind of like um, uh, moved around like a nomad uh, and, and lived in Europe, uh, Canada, and before I actually um, migrated to the US about 25 years ago. My background is in physics and space science, uh, but really focus more on program development, operations, entrepreneurship, um, educational management for the past kind of like, you know, three decades, um, worked on startup companies uh, from space tourism all the way to uh, companies that are um, planning to land rovers and landers on the moon. Um, and then moved to Silicon Valley like about uh, 10 years ago um, before uh, moving here uh, to New Zealand about four years ago. Right. Yeah, and uh, I don't think I'll add too much. Uh, you've already mentioned uh, my background's in astronomy and, and space engineering, and I worked at, on NASA projects, uh, and then uh, and also involved with the International Space University, which is where we met, and, uh, and then uh, working in California on space startups, and then coming to New Zealand four years ago. Yeah, so um, even though we're here in New Zealand, we actually uh, still maintain all of our global networks. So as Eric mentioned, the International Space University, uh, Singularity University, and then also the NASA Frontier Development Lab. And we're still connected with a bunch of uh, global and international organizations and startups uh, as well uh, back in the US. But the, yeah, the really the reason why we're here in New Zealand is we started SpaceBase, which is a social enterprise uh, that are really are focused kind of like we talk about it as our moonshot, um, where we're really focused on like shrinking the gap um, between uh, the 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 difference between the spacefaring nations like the U.S. and 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 uh, China and Russia to those uh, that are still still kind of like emerging. If we really believe that the future of uh, humanity is is actually um, you know going out and and uh, settling and exploring sort of the solar system, we wanna make sure that everybody comes along with us. And so that's really the point of, of space base is uh, how do you then create that, how to create uh, ecosystems in different uh, countries all over the world so that we can actually enable uh, that. So that's sort of like our, our moonshot. Uh, what we do, so kind of like it's in three different buckets. Um, uh, education. So we've done over a hundred uh, presentations all over like, New Zealand. We uh, created a training program as well for adjacent industries of how do you catalyze uh, your ecosystem using adjacent uh, or, or already existing capabilities. Uh, we also do entrepreneurship and innovation. So we, uh, we run uh, challenges um, and we mentor startups as well. Uh, and then uh, 
on the third side in terms of um, ecosystem building as part of our consulting service uh, we also do business attraction we do technical diligence for uh, vcs um, and basically help uh, catalyze like communities uh, as well in like the different parts of um, of new zealand right. yeah so um uh, one aspect of, of this is that uh, the space, uh, the world of space is is not just the launches of rockets, and uh, we there there's so many different elements of space activity. Uh, uh, there's, of course, we're with the Mars Society. You always you're familiar with the um, uh, long range goals of Mars settlement, but all these different elements uh, are opportunities. You know, building up the capability to toward uh, toward the larger uh, settlement of the solar system and so it's it's both near term for you know opportunities for people to get involved in space and then also elements that you need for the larger systems and so we have uh you know this is a very rough uh alignment of of uh, these different segments with in barriers to entry going from low to high to you know more difficult on the high on the top part and then uh, what we see roughly is an opportunity timeline going from near-term things on the left to uh, very uh, long-range things on the right. And so, you know, some of these things are, are you know, like education or, or even some of the near-term opportunities in remote sensing and data analysis, um, all the way out to long-range, you know, mining of resources and manufacturing in space. And some sometimes there's little opportunities that we think may be long term but are potentially uh, not uh, have much of a barrier to entry like uh, food production which is uh, a big unknown for for Mars settlement for example uh, let's see um, so uh, things have certainly been changing in the last in the last few years in space uh, we have lots of demonstration of re reusable rockets for, for SpaceX and and here in New Zealand rocket lab is is uh, going to be demonstrating reusing parts of their vehicle too, and we have um, uh, we also have uh, some beginnings of zero g manufacturing on the space station uh, with a uh, three uh, d printers uh, manufacturing things, and we have uh, commercially acquired uh, you know uh, transport of astronauts by NASA and and lots of opportunities for lunar missions as well as and so all this comes back to or is driven in a large part by exponential technologies by which we mean uh, especially the transformation of computing power so that this is a plot over uh, more than 100 years of the increasing capability of computing power over time um, and so if you if you look back in the uh well like i uh, this is, uh, you know, a billion billion times scale here, and I've, uh, in my lifetime, I've seen a, a factor of a billion increase in the power of computing. Uh, and this computing power is spilling over into uh, driving industries from nanotech and AI robotics and biotech, and uh, it's also driving uh, the space world too, so that uh, and just as an example, like if you add up all the computing power that was used in the Apollo program, uh, uh, one smartphone is a million, 100, uh, 100 million times faster than, uh, than all of the, the computing power in Apollo. So it's, uh, so that means that, that uh, you know, you can actually have small teams that design lunar landers that just use this computing power for helping to land on a moon, for example. And so we have um, like one, one example that we often look at is the, uh, the power of uh, remote sensing and, and data analysis, uh, where uh, it used to be that the software was $50,000, the hardware you needed was $50,000. And now uh, an ordinary laptop is more powerful and the analysis software is often free and the access to the, uh, the data archives from Europe and and the US and others are, are free. So uh, in, the, in the satellite world, we've gone from you know, satellites the size of, 
of cars or trucks and down to uh, CubeSat as a standard uh, of, of just, uh, you know, 10 centimeters on a side or 30 centimeters. And then there are also some experiments with uh, even smaller uh, nanosets and, and chip sets. Uh, an example of, of how this is sort of uh, turned into a commodity is, is uh, friends at Endurosat in, in Bulgaria. It will sell you a integrated uh, CubeSat for around 50,000 euros. Um, and uh, so one thing it allows you to do is you can think about a payload or a special application and, and you just procure the, the rest of the satellite uh, as, a, uh, as a service. So uh, that's allowed some of our friends to go uh, uh, build companies based on, on the CubeSat. Um, I wonder if you can see the, the first uh, Planet Labs uh, satellite in this picture. Uh, it's, it's over here on, this, on the table. And so uh, they started building these satellites using things like uh, smartphone technology. And now they've launched 200 of them and, and uh, scan the world every day. And so that's, they're now the largest remote sensing company uh, in the world. Starting from a garage in Cupertino. Yeah. So, so I think it's, a, it's also a good to kind of like uh, look at just, you know, from a, a thousand foot, foot uh, lens, what the global space industry is now and, and, and how it currently operates. So um, this is, uh, it's a little bit of uh, out of date uh, from 2018, but uh, this kind of like represents the government space budgets of, uh, around the world. And at least it shows that it's no longer just like the, you know, the US, which of course still has like the biggest pie uh, here, but at the same time, there are now so many different countries um, that are kind of like putting budgets, at least on their government side, uh, on space-related activities. Um, yeah, th this is really um, a little outdated because even New Zealand is not uh, on here, which uh, we know has, has actually quite a number of activities happening uh, at the moment. Uh, in terms of the global space uh, economy in total, um, so like right now, uh, again, uh, it's $366 billion and the- and, and all those government parts were, are in the brown Yeah, in the brown, which is also uh, another interesting thing because it's, it's a misnomer that people say, well, the space industry is mostly government uh, run, but actually it's only one fourth of the pie. Um, and, and also uh, other things here is, so, so the, the global space industry is, uh, is now, um, you know, predicted to be 1.1 trillion by 2040. And that's actually the most conservative number. They actually think that it's about probably 3 trillion. Uh, the other thing to, to, to note here too, is that, you know, people are always talking about launches um, uh, and rockets. But as you can see here, this little sliver here of launch uh, is really, that's it. Um, uh, and so then what is the 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 like the seventy five percent of the of the pie? It's really more mostly on applications uh, and and mostly uh, on really the satellite industry. So another um, uh, stats here as well is that because of um, the increase in the interest in in the global uh, space industry, there's now a lot of uh, investment that is also going into startups. Uh, as you can see here, over ten years, it went from zero to about seven point five billion dollars um, in in about a decade. And as you can see, there's a, like different types of uh, of funding uh, that is that is also happening. Uh, this is another interesting um, uh, chart here, where also it used to be that it's only or it's dominated by U.S. investors, uh, but as you can see now in 2020. Uh, it's actually there's more non-US investors uh, that are putting um, investments in startups. Um, I also wanted to, to uh, point this one out. Uh, so basically, um, uh, as of today, uh, there's about like 1,654 companies that are that are receiving investments um, like worldwide. Uh, and then again, um, showing here on the pie where, 
most of those investments are actually going into applications. Uh, so there's about 74%. Uh, uh, and then also the other thing as well is that even with COVID, um, the space industry is actually going, uh, is increasing. So if you can look at between the 2019 and 2020, and of course, we're not finished with 2020, uh, 2021 yet, uh, there's definitely an increase uh, there. So it's one of the rare industries that was not totally um, affected by COVID. So, and because of that 74% uh, kind of like under applications, it also shows the exponential increase in launches of satellites, as you can also see here uh, within just the, like the last decade, which drove the kind of the, the, um, the beginnings of the small satellite launch market. So uh, before Rocket Lab, which uh, Rocket Lab is, I guess, more well known that it's, uh, it, la it launches from New Zealand, although it's a, it's a US company. Um, uh, it didn't exist be before Rocket Lab. Uh, and so Rocket Lab is the pioneer of this like small launchers. And today there's about 150 companies that are trying to do what Rocket Lab is doing. Now, of course, there's most of those as, as vaporware, uh, but at the same time, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of interest, um, especially in, in this particular uh, segment of the market. And as a result, uh, also globally, there's now a lot of um, VCs that are not just, you know, traditional VCs, but, uh, but actually there are VCs that are being, being um, created just for space uh, companies. Uh, and then also incubators and accelerators that are, that are also uh, being created just for space startups. Now the uh, going so I talked about the, the global in industry uh, because we're from New Zealand uh, we're just gonna give you a little bit of a, uh, an understanding of what the, of what the New Zealand space industry is and how well, we see um, ecosystem building uh, is related to this. So when we first got here, um, you know, there's really not much going on. Like there's the the New Zealand Space Agency was like about four months old. Rocket Lab hasn't even launched, but uh, when when we started, we knew that there were certain elements that you kind of like need to create like a, a sustainable space ecosystem. And, and some of these are, are, are here. So uh, the very important uh, thing is a, a progressive government and a government that actually supports sort of um, the, uh, the, the, the industry in itself. So that's one. The other thing is that uh, there's already an existing entrepreneurial and educational uh, and high tech sort of like ecosystem. Um, which then funnels uh, uh, those uh, uh, the, the talent into the industry. Um, we're very um, fortunate that, of course, the Rocket Lab is here, and so therefore there's now launch facilities that are available. But I think the two most important thing as well uh, is that location-wise, New Zealand is uh, very conducive to um, you know polar launches because there's a lot more um, kind of. Um, uh, yeah, directions, directions uh, for, for launch. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, there's not a lot of areas left in the world that has very little uh, kind of like air traffic. So which means that frequency of launches is definitely much better. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the last bit is that there is a culture of innovation uh, here where I think because of the isolation of New Zealand, uh, they've cultivated innovation and plus ingenuity which at the combination really it lends well to a, a risky sort of like industry like the like space. Um, so what did we first do when we, we got here? We first wanted to know, well, where are the companies and where are the organizations that are doing some activity? So we created a directory um, and we found like about 200 plus organizations where mo when we got here, most of the people here actually said, well, are there, you know, a handful? Uh, but there are. But this led to a report um, that then uh, basically found that there's about 1.7 billion dollars that are already directly contributing to the New Zealand uh, economy. Um, and that that helped the the government give attention to the yeah the space. Agency, um, space and this agency. is sort of like the the their segments of where they thought from the directory that we created where they thought the, uh, the, the industry is. And one thing to note again, uh, where 
you know, the, the, the biggest part, which is the 1 billion, is again in space applications and not where you would normally think where Rocket Lab's manufacturing um, and launch services is. Uh, so again, this is just like a summary of how, um, where the distribution of, of where um, the companies and organizations are in New Zealand. So, so because of the directory, you also managed to pinpoint where in the, in the country, uh, things are are beginning to build up. So, for example, where we are here in Christchurch, there's a lot of manufacturing, um, and so therefore, you know, uh, sensors and and uh, precision engineering uh, is certainly something that they're focusing on. While down in the south, there are ground stations, uh, and then up in Auckland, there's more manufacturing uh, and uh, kind of like mission operations of satellites. And then, like lastly, on the New Zealand side. Uh, this is just like um, um, kind of like our summary of who's the the the, the um, rising kind of like uh, companies that are um, that are starting out in in New Zealand, and, and they range from basically satellite companies to uh, different types of of space transportation, not just Rocket Lab, uh, but like space planes, for example. Yeah, so it seemed to help that to highlight, you know these companies to and make people aware of them and it they can work together they can you know build off each other they can uh, inspire people to start something similar or they can use the capabilities and and the government finally is paying paying attention because of these unique uh, air, uh, companies so um uh just to look at uh i wanted to look at some of the overview of the different industry segments and opportunities there and and first, I'll start off just as uh, with definitions of the uh, uh, there's upstream manufacturing, which is sort of the satellite manufacturing and launcher and launching. Uh, and then there's the downstream applications. When you get the satellite data down um, or for services for uh, for different customers. And so first looking at some of the downstream markets. Um, there's been a lot of experimenting in, in New Zealand with uh, precision agriculture, which is trying to use uh, connect more of the, the satellite remote sensing to monitor the health of crops and and uh, improve uh, production and and also uh, use of navigation, you know, for with GPS controlled uh, sensing and uh, sensors and things like that. Um, New Zealand happens to be responsible for a huge area of the ocean for uh um safety monitoring and things like that and so uh there, there's a lot of use of satellites to track fishing fleets um with uh tracking their their uh, sensors that are on the ships and uh and one global uh aspect of this is that you can actually monitor where ships turn off their sensors and may be involved with illegal fishing and things like that and so there's a con uh, a global effort to uh, to try to track and identify uh, and some, uh, illegal fishing. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of interest in Australia, for example, on, on monitoring wildfires, bushfires that that um, uh, detecting them quickly from orbit and monitoring their behavior. Um, that's a and so uh, and then recently there's there's uh, as where the uh, SpaceX with Starlink has launched their constellation to provide internet service and a bunch of others are, are launching their satellites. Um, and uh, we just happened to also have, for the last six months have used our, our Starlink. And so we're using that right now. So some of the um, opportunities, uh, oftentimes when we talk to people in New Zealand, we're talking about uh, adjacent industry. So we give examples of, of companies that do this for terrestrial applications on Earth, and then com uh, companies in New Zealand that do it in space. And so, for example, in precision engineering, there's another, a couple of companies or a few that are in New Zealand that are actually um, doing precision engineering and manufacturing. Uh, but there's a lot of applications where there's, you know, uh, uh, other companies that do things for health products and consumer products have almost the right capability for doing space activities. So it's there's a an opportunity to transition there, and in a similar way for electronics for um, for spacecraft and sensors, uh, 
there's a lot of companies that are doing very similar work uh, for terrestrial applications. You talking about the, the iPhone actually as an example. Yeah, that that um, uh, and actually our friends at Planet uh, got a start from uh, they were they were tasked at NASA to keep on building smaller and smaller satellites, and finally they said, well, a lot of these things we want to do are are very similar to what a phone uh, can do. And so they just launched a phone into space to see if it would work. And it, and it did. They were able to remotely control it and, and take pictures and uh, transmit them down to the ground. And so uh, they realized that a lot of the components within a phone, um, the accelerometer and, and various sensors, would work in space. If, and if, if they uh, had a problem, they could just reboot it and, and uh, get people working. And, and, and I think that really started the democratization of the satellite industry. Because before, uh, yeah, you'd always think that uh, you know you need clean rooms, you need like really specific uh, types of sensors and electronics uh, to, to, to be used for, for spacecraft and, and, and satellites. Yeah. yeah, so they took a, you know, the, a, the, the gyroscope was used to be thirty thousand dollars and this big for space, and it got replaced by a three dollar chip. And so it's it's um, yeah, this the uh, transformation. Um, there's there's uh, testing systems. Uh, you know, there's specific thermal and vibration tests you need for space equipment, but it's but there are a lot of terrestrial testing systems that can provide that. And, and just maybe to 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 add there is that uh, in, um, we always think of uh, again um, space as highly um, you know you, that you always have to test uh, rigorously or be unique situation and, and be unique but really uh, the the testing for you know avionics and and other types of like terrestrial uh, equipment is a lot more complex than testing for space, which is really what they call a shake and bake. It's like it, it really trying to just make sure that it survives sort of the launch, yeah. the, the launch um, and the vibrations. Yeah, that, once that you're in space, it. then it's very predictable environment. So it's, it's, that's good. Um, uh, and there's a lot of uh, New Zealand, just with its uh, location near uh, at a high latitude, it's, it, it's a great spot for uh, ground stations for polar orbiting satellites. Um, there's a lot of what we think about as, as space with the traditional propulsion rockets. Um, not only do we have Rocket Lab in the in New Zealand, uh, we have Dawn, a new company, Dawn Aerospace, making a space plane and also making a uh, on-orbit thrusters for They're satellites. Green. Yeah, and and here's an example just from last week that Dawn posted a sales chart of that. Uh, it's sort of encouraging that if you come up with a new um, ad, uh, design, in this case using non-toxic propellant, um, then you then suddenly the industry will adopt it quickly. And so there's that's uh, it's a uh, it, they're ready. The industry is ready for new ideas and new systems. So that's encouraging. Um, oh, and then uh, some of the other areas uh, we're you're familiar with with the. SpaceX Mars settlement plan, really big scale. And there's also large government programs, the NASA and ESA missions to the moon and, and uh, a lot of other international uh, com countries uh, going to the moon. Um, there's also, uh, NASA is actually has this program of procuring, of buying uh, landers and rovers to, for the moon from commercial companies that then have extra space and can actually have a be a quicker way to and less bureaucratic way of getting payloads onto the moon yeah. and uh, and so that we're working with this company Ceres Robotics and and there's a lot of opportunities just uh, bypassing NASA you know just going directly to these companies that when they fly um, and then we're also working with uh, some companies that have started up uh, like extraterrestrial power in New Zealand, trying to make uh, solar cells out of lunar material. Um, and uh, a, a company here in Christchurch making uh, cement that uh, out of lun simulated lunar material. And- uh, Explain about the, the sim uh, why it's important. Yeah, I mean, but uh, for one thing, um, it turns out that with the big, really big landers like the SpaceX um, Starship, uh, 
it, it when you land on an unprepared surface on the moon or mars you kick up all these rocks and regolith and um it, if you're right next to a habitat it can punch holes in the habitat and so you what you want is landing pads and so there's a big uh interest in what how do you build landing pads on the moon and mars after you start your your lunar or mars base using basically local, yeah, local material resources yeah yeah so so this one these this professor thought this might be used in like 20 or 30 years and we we're saying no no we need it right away <laughs> in in two or three years so so they're working on that um and then uh here in in christchurch it's uh it's one of the gateway cities to Antarctica, and we're trying to apply the lessons we've learned for running Antarctic programs for for uh, future settlements. But there's uh, another. Uh, these are students. Yeah, these are our former students who uh, created a company called Maiden Space that uh, made uh, 3D printers that are flying on the space station, and they're also designing a 3D printer that can operate in zero in vacuum. Um, for building really large structures in in space. So it used to be like ten years ago. It was just a uh, it was a student project um, that was part of Singularity University, um, and uh, they basically um, got grants from government um, and, and then did an exit. Uh, the, they got acquired by Redwire. By Redwire. Yeah, yeah. So here they were. You know, very quickly they were testing on the on the zero g aircraft and then they got uh, they were able to put uh, several printers on the space station uh, but we we are we keep running around trying to convince people to to pay attention to agriculture and growing food in space because uh, every once in a while nasa will say this is a big biggest stumbling block towards you know a, a large scale settlement and there's very few people working on this around the world so it's uh uh, so we, we encourage people to, to think about how do you make food and pharmaceuticals and things like that. Because that's space. really the, the, the it's a critical step to um, a lot of the, the long term settlements that we're Matt Damon to... showed us you can just bring some potatoes and that'll be <laughs> fine. <laughs> and let's see what I don't see who we have. Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, the last uh, segment to to our presentation is just going back to um, you know uh, catalyzing a, a space industry. In, uh, what can you do, for example, in in an area where it's just uh, emerging? Um, and um, so uh, really, uh, uh, the the main point here is capacity building. Um, uh, and so, how do you create capacity building? Uh, first, you need to have the skills uh, and the education uh, that will then, um, you know, create the individuals to and, and then create the jobs to for the new economy. Uh, so what we did, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we started out with a with a directory. Uh, so we created a platform on our website, and the platform is pretty clunky, but at the same time, um, it, it is a uh, it is an open source um, uh, uh, GitHub project that if anybody would want to leverage it, uh, it's certainly there. Uh, and we managed to also, I guess, inspire uh, another organization in, 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 uh, in Africa to create a, a platform. And the, uh, the good way of doing platforms is being able to at least get a directory uh, going um and harness sort of like where uh those organizations and individuals are so that's the first thing that we 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 did um and then as i mentioned also we run challenges so we we're now on our third challenge uh, this is one example from uh 2019 where we latch on to a, a problem that is important to uh the local area uh, and then leverage like satellite technology and, and, and data to solve the problem. Uh, the great thing about challenges is that it actually hits you know many different uh, things with one uh, with one uh, initiative. Um, it creates innovation, it solves problems. Uh, it can also birth like startups and and projects uh, and, and research. So as part and, of and these are um, typically. Uh, a few months, uh, a couple months long, and with a big prize, you know, like a 
$30,000 prize. Right. No, but at the same time, uh, the concept of competitions doesn't have to be big. I mean, you could actually do either hackathons or you can do small prizes to kind of like incentivize people to, for, to, to innovate and, and create ideas. So as part of the, the challenge as well, we ran the very first New Zealand Aerospace Virtual Incubator uh, in, in New Zealand. So what we did was, yeah, we had webinars um, that talk about the technology and the problem, but we also interspersed with that is we, we had uh, sessions on design thinking, pro rapid prototyping, you know, creating your own MVP and, and, and all that and have mentors and, uh, and coaches uh, as well. So that sort of like helped um, the, the teams that were uh, going through the challenge uh, to also work on their and, and develop their, their ideas. This year, uh, we're working on a Space for Planet Earth Challenge. Uh, it is only for um, focused on New Zealand, uh, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. Um, but again, uh, similarly using a prize cash uh, award and, and benefits to uh, kind of like jumpstart and incentivize uh, something that is also very important to, to the region. Uh, the other thing that we, we kind of like did um, quite earlier on is is basically just like starting communities so just like what what you have with having a mars uh, society um that uh, can uh, really gather and and sort of um, create vision. a community mm -hmm. yeah. yep yeah yeah and create a community um we you know we started out with just a meetup uh, in wellington which we uh, uh which we are still uh, sort of like helping coordinate, even though we were now in, Ch in Christchurch. We got connected to the Aerospace Christchurch in, in here, and now there's about like 200 people that go every time uh, that they have a um, like a a session. Um, we I also run a podcast as well. It's just like it helps to inspire others by uh, interviewing people that have actually gone through uh, a career and, and understand like how uh, they go about um, uh, creating a career in space. Um, we also help um, catalyze the form, the formation of the New Zealand Student Space Association, um, which is connected to SEDS, which is a global uh, a global uh, or a space organization. But then they created then chapters as well in the in the different sort of like cities. So that's sort of like a way of um, trying to to coordinate and and create a, a um, kind of like a bigger community. Um, and then the, the other thing uh, as well is that uh, beyond having local organizations, you can also latch on to bigger organizations, just like, uh, again, um, the Mars Society. There are uh, like um, the Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, there's uh, you know, the UN um, Office of Outer Space Affairs have actually a lot of other programs they have mentorship as well, especially for women. Um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of UNICEF. Uh, UNICEF is uh, another one that's out of Japan where they help teach um, teachers and students on uh, how to build and operate um, yeah, like basically CubeSats. CubeSats. Yeah. Um, then there's, of course, the Moon Village Association uh, as well. Uh, so there's a bunch of other organizations that, that the, I think the beauty of, of being connected to a global organization is the resources and the network that they actually provide um, on a global scale. So the, the last thing that we also did, I mentioned this uh, earlier, that we, we created a, a workshop uh, or a training workshop um, for uh, basically uh, economic development agencies and um, uh, also adjacent industries here to kind of like assess uh, what they have uh, in order to be able to see if they can, you know, using what already existing capabilities to be part of, of, of a, a space um, uh, industry. And we have the, a light version of this is there is a there is an online version uh, that you can just go through uh, yourself and it's on spacebase.thinkific.com. So I think um, in summary, um, again, I think uh, I know we talked about a lot of, of, of different things, but uh, just emphasizing that, you know, the space industry now, uh, the definition of the space industry is, is much bigger. It's the entire kind of like supply chain um, 
of of missions um and that each i always think that i think every terrestrial industry has an analog uh, in space and it's really just that terrestrial industry um applied to extreme environments which is which is where space is um we talked about exponential technology i think the, the things that are happening today would not be happening um like you know 10 years ago or 15 years ago uh, because we hadn't kind of like reached the inflection point um but exponential technologies have, has, has, has now made it possible um adjacent industries uh have uh, definitely advantages to participate uh, because you already have kind of like the, the skills and the uh, the experience that can just be ported um there are specific elements that are needed to create a stable uh, space industry and we talked about that uh, earlier um from location to to a to a um to governments and existing entrepreneurial ecosystems um uh, so yeah, it's important to understand uh, kind of like uh, where you're coming from in assessing what the uh, opportunities and what the, the benefits and what what are what are your needs still um, to be able to to create uh, the ecosystem. So I think um, that's uh, all we have, <laughs> and uh, we can certainly uh, here's our. So uh, yeah, I, I guess this is, uh, I always put this uh, as, as my kind of um, my quote where the, the, yeah, the future is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed. And that is this the reason why we want to democratize a space because we want everybody um, to be part of kind of like this abundant future that we the, we will all want to have. Uh, and this is our, um, our, our contacts. contacts if you um, want to, uh, reach out to us there's our emails um our website uh as i mentioned we i do a podcast every month um and then also um the uh oh, i guess the 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 the, the, the catalyzing a space industry um online is just think uh, space based that thank you that's so it. thank you very much the um, attendance uh, feel free to submit your questions as there will be a q a time uh, as I mentioned earlier in the chats, uh, and uh, now again, uh, I also have some questions by myself. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, uh, New Zealand has a very supportive uh, government who is supporting the development of space industry, right? Uh, so, what, what do you think would be the selling point of the idea for Georgian government to support the development of space industry in Georgia? What would be a good way to communicate that with the authorities? Um, let's see, a That's couple a elements. Uh, one is that um, with the barriers of, for entry have come down, okay, with the uh, exponential technologies that uh, it's, it's much, uh, much it doesn't require hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, it requires some, some money, but doesn't, uh, it's not that huge. Um, the, any kind of, uh, industry that you have now uh you know in both in manufacturing and also in data analysis or anything um they're very close to taking advantage of of space as an opportunity and that space continues to grow at remarkable rates uh you know the space industry is you know between five and twenty percent per year and and uh, uh and so there's the opportunities keep on growing uh, in space, and it's easier now than ever for these comp these existing industries to take advantage of it. So it's uh, those are a few elements, um, and that that one thing we you know when we arrived in New Zealand, um, these people were doing things, but they weren't talking to each other, and so uh, our, us going around and and making this directory and getting people to talk to each other. Uh, had, uh, I think enabled a lot of things to happen. So uh, that can be part of the process. Uh, and finally, when they did the study, uh, they were shocked to discover that, you know, the space industry in New Zealand is as big as the New Zealand wine industry and things like that. So they started to pay attention to it. Oh, thank you very much. So, so another question from uh, Tanta. Uh, so 
she wants to hear at what stage New Zealand is uh, right now. Uh, have they already sent satellites, rockets without people, rockets with animals, rockets with people? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, I would say. So, so Rocket Lab is uh, started in New Zealand, uh, became a U.S. company launching from New Zealand, mm -hmm. and they've launched uh, 20 rockets so far. Um, uh, no, no people or animals on board. Um, they launch, uh, you know, a, a few hundred kilograms uh, in each launch, and they, uh, um, let's see, they've launched like 50 satellites, uh, you know, with, on these things. They're, they're getting ready to uh, be able to launch toward the moon, Venus, and Mars using this small launch vehicle. And they also have, they're starting to build a, a larger launch vehicle that is the same, can lift the same capability as the Soyuz uh, launcher. And so eight, eight tons rather than uh, 300 kilograms. So they, they and uh, when they developed that, they mentioned that they are actually going to human certify it. So it's still a long way off, but the, the fact that it's in their in their plans uh, to human certify, which means that at some point in time, they created um, kind of either vehicle. Um, and they're also copying SpaceX and wanting to reuse the, the launch launcher right, to, yeah. to, to reduce the cost. So yes. the, next, the next launch, actually, they're gonna um, uh, recover the, the booster. The yeah. booster. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, so, are there any future plans for other planets and moons such and as moon. Venus? Yeah, yeah. There's. Um, uh, I'm I'm a big fan of asteroids uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, when I started studying, like, I gave my first presentation on mining asteroids 40 years ago. Okay, and uh, that's how old I am. And uh, at that time, we we knew of 12 Earth-crossing asteroids. And now we know of 25,000 Earth crossing asteroids and, you know, uh, about a, a, a hundred are just dis discovered every week. And so um, they're, uh, in, they're just fantastic uh, resources for building things in space. Um, and maybe uh, you can talk about the gravity well. And yeah, the yeah. I mean, it's like, so, uh, you know, much I'm, better. Um, you know, uh, Mars is a uh, fantastic interesting world with uh, amazing ancient geology uh, but I I'm a big fan of of building space habitats uh, in uh, with asteroid material and rotating and you know living inside these these uh, artificially constructed habitats and so uh, it's you know I think we'll be doing all of this all and, and the, the reason, same time. and the reason for that is that it's actually much uh, easier yeah i mean it's, it's to, once you go into mars then you you also have to launch off of it you know of course and mm -hmm. and or, or to come back and and with the with an asteroid you just push away basically <laughs> but uh but yeah there's so there's um the asteroids and there's there's a lot of activity in the on the moon there's uh maybe uh, how many missions are coming up on the moon it's like 15, 15. Uh, over the next five years how many 15 anyway 15. okay um, and about then, 15 countries. 15 countries, yeah. Over and the there's next, like, uh, like there's five like years. like 50 missions planned. And then Venus is really interesting. It's like uh, if you if you land on the surface, it's a it's a hellish environment, and you get crushed and and melted at the same time. It. And, you know, everyone yeah. But, but there's what what's weird about Venus is that there's this one layer in the clouds where it's a nice, pleasant temperature and pleasant pressure and Mm -hmm. And so people have started to design these things about floating balloons, you know, that, you know, you just, it would be a wonderful, just, you just make sure that the balloon never fails, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. All right. So I guess uh, there are no more questions. So uh, thanks again for, you know, your generosity and finding the time and for this great presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll also be asking you to submit to me uh, your social media links for the space base and, you know, the website so yep. I can include that later. Uh, and uh, also thanks to everyone uh, for, for joining and uh, there is another upcoming event on 3rd of November about space, space initiatives in Georgia. Uh, uh, so hope to see you all there as well. Uh